The first reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, the 25th chapter. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from the book of Philippians, the fourth chapter. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all who they could fo- how they found, both good and bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Okay, good morning. 
All right, I am a big fan of Paul. I know not everybody loves Paul, but I really like Paul. I connect with his energy and enthusiasm. Big surprise. I appreciate that he throws his whole self into his calling, knowing that God can use his whole self. In today's reading from Philippians, Paul is urging the church in Philippi to stay focused on what is honorable, just, pure, and excellent, to stay in constant communication with God about everything in their lives through prayer, and to rejoice always. Paul is also in jail. Paul is the ultimate picture of someone who lives in the moment. It appears that for Paul, being in jail is not an interruption of a grand, lifelong plan to share the gospel. It is a part of his daily journey to share the gospel. He even says in chapter 1, I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. It is as if Paul has his grand mission and his loose daily schedule. <clears throat> I gotta read. Um, his loose daily schedule. And it, his grand mission is to tell everyone about Jesus. And he makes travel plans, which he sticks to when he can, but his travel plans are not the point. His mission of sharing about Jesus is the point. So whether he's sharing about Jesus in a new town or in a jail, it doesn't matter much to him. In fact, I'm sure that if God told him there were people in the jail who needed to hear about Jesus, he would have gladly gotten himself arrested on purpose. Now, we give him a lot of credit for how he responds to these surprises that life throws at him. Jail, shipwrecks, things like that. Perhaps he wasn't always this flexible. Remember, Paul is the poster child for an interrupted life. He was working very enthusiastically to persecute people who were following Jesus until the day that Jesus himself interrupted that life and offered him another one instead. So being in jail is maybe anticlimactic for Paul. His circumstances matter little in the grand scheme of his mission. Paul goes through life with an understanding that the work of God is needed everywhere, or rather, that God is at work everywhere. So anywhere Paul happens to be is a great place to join with the work of God. Now, Pastor Tom said something at our weekly Bible study a week or two ago that has stuck with me. And if you haven't checked out the weekly Zoom Bible studies at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays, you're missing out. He said, the church doesn't have a mission. The mission has a church. Which is to say, the church is not the point. The mission is the point. And the church is one tool we use to support the mission. If we think like Paul, we realize that the church is a great part of an overall plan to support the mission of sharing God's love and telling people about grace. But when church is interrupted, as it kind of is now, God's love can and does still continue to be shared. And with church interrupted, it can be easier for us to notice other places where God is at work in the world. Which brings us to the question of, what does God's work in the world look like? We've been talking about the kingdom of God, the reign of God in the world. How God's plan is to bring the kingdom of God fully to earth. Or, to use Rob Bell's words, heaven comes crashing into earth. An image that I love because it paints a picture of the beauty of heaven interrupting the ugliness we see around us. So what does heaven on earth look like? Isaiah says it looks like a feast. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines. He will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. It's a feast. Death is gone. Sad tears are gone. Worries and grief and hunger are gone. God provides the best food and drink for all the people. It's going to be a great day.
and we can enjoy it because we're all a part of it. But of course, we're not quite there yet. Though sometimes it feels like it's right there, most of the time it feels like we're as far from that feast as it's possible to be. That is the mysterious nature of the now and not yetness of the reign of God. It's here now because Jesus has indeed conquered death. But it's not fully here. It's happening all around us, or could be, but complicated decisions and life is still being lived and there's interactions and relationships that are far from perfect still. Which brings us to our gospel lesson and a dose of cold, hard reality. I would love to say that when faced with an interrupted life, I would be like Paul, unflappably positive and sharing the love of Jesus no matter where I am. But in today's gospel reading, we see another possibly more likely scenario. Thinking back through the past couple weeks, you'll remember that Jesus is still in the middle of the conversation with the religious leaders who are challenging his authority and looking on him with suspicion. Tensions are high. As a reminder, these conversations are happening during the growing drama of Holy Week. In last week's lesson, the Pharisees made the connection that they were the bad guys in the parables, and they really wanted to arrest him, but they paused on those plans because they were afraid of the crowds. After today's parable, they actually start plotting to entrap him, and the story rolls on to Good Friday. Now, to be fair, Jesus told them that the tax collectors and prostitutes were going to the kingdom of God ahead of them. He told them that the kingdom would be taken away from them and given to those who produce fruits from the kingdom. And now, today's less than flattering picture. I don't blame them for being a little disgruntled. Nobody likes to see themselves as the bad guy. And I think we can agree that today's parable is a little over the top. Jesus tells them that the kingdom of heaven is like a king throwing a huge wedding celebration. He sends out his servants to call on the invited guests and let them know it's time for the party. But they don't come. They decide instead to keep working, which is a bit insulting to the king. We've seen several royal wedding celebrations in recent history. I happened to catch the wedding of Prince William and Catherine Middleton in 2011 because my oldest was just a couple months old. So being awake at 5.30 in the morning was pretty normal, unfortunately. I remember what a big deal it was, though. It was a red carpet event with commentators dishing on everything from dress designers to family drama. To highlight the ridiculousness of today's parable, can you imagine saying no to that wedding invitation? Can you imagine saying no because you had better things to do? Not even cool things, boring things like work. <sighs> worse and worse. In the parable, some of the invited guests respond to the royal wedding invitation not just by refusing, but by mistreating and killing the king's messengers who brought the invitation. An absurd escalation that would never happen. And speaking of absurd escalations, the king responds to these rejections by flattening the city. He kills those who rejected the invitation and burns the city to the ground. And then, since apparently that didn't take very long, and the food was still ready, and everything was in place, the king invited the B and C list folks who didn't get the original invitation. The king instructed his slaves to invite everyone they could find. There is now no discernment in the quality of the guests. It's just everyone who's left. In a final strange twist, the king notices that one of the guests is not dressed up, so he has his attendants throw that person into the outer darkness. Absurdities abound. What are we to make of this in light of the now and not yet reign of God? Once again, we hear that God's big plan, the reign of God, heaven on earth, is the world's best party. God sends out invitations and more invitations. God keeps inviting folks and everyone ends up invited. It's not a merit-based invitation. By the end, it says folks who were invited were both good and bad. 
Just like Isaiah's feast, there's enough for all people. And thank goodness, because that's who ends up being invited. All people. Such a generous invitation doesn't make the invited guests look any better. The original invited guests. The religious leaders Jesus was talking to were supposed to be the experts on God. They, of all people, should have recognized Jesus. They were right there, seeing the miracles, hearing the stories, upfront eyewitnesses. In theory, they were supposed to be God's partner in God's big plan to bring heaven to earth. But they don't appear to understand the feel and scope of this party. They know Isaiah. They know it's a feast for all people. But in the context of Jesus telling the religious leaders who, that they are the first guests who are there, that they're there at that very moment plotting to kill Jesus. So maybe that's not such an absurd parable after all. There is a long tradition, one that continues today, of people in power being at best unresponsive and at worst hostile to the messengers of God. So while on the one hand, all the invited guests needed to do was say yes to the invitation, it sounds so easy. But in the context of their perspective as religious leaders, it was a big risk because it meant upending the power structures they were benefiting from. And in the context of Matthew's retelling of the parable after the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, the party had started, but they were still sitting out. Perhaps that's where the underdressed guest comes in. It was hard for them to let go of their expectations of what the kingdom of God was going to look like. Remember Jesus' triumphal entry? and how he subverted everyone's expectations of the Messiah. And like many of us, lacking imagination, following God becomes more about good behavior and control rather than invitation and celebration. So where are we in this story? I think it would benefit us to consider ourselves in the shoes of the originally invited guests or the religious leaders Jesus was speaking to. The ones that are too busy to say yes to the invitation. The ones who are hostile to the messenger. Because from there, we can grow. From there, we can make different choices than the guests in the story did. And we can prioritize differently. Especially now, when our flexibility and adaptability muscles are being stretched daily in a world that looks nothing like it did even a year ago. What does the interrupting reign of God look like in our world now? What does it look like to live the reign as if the reign of God is present now and the party is ongoing and everyone is invited? I would love to hear your answers to those questions. My email's on the website. You should send me a note. What does the reign of God look like in our world today? Which brings me back to Paul. We are not in jail, like Paul, but we are living in very strange times that have thrown the normal patterns of our lives completely into a tailspin. Let's agree that we are not going to make the mistakes of the religious leaders that Jesus was speaking to. So our other option is to listen to Paul and his encouragement to rejoice, which I admit can feel hollow in the midst of all the anger and grief and uncertainty that fills our lives right now. But we are also living in the now and not yet reign of God. And Paul, from his unplanned mission field in prison, reminds us where to put our focus. Imagine that Paul is writing to you right now. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. From now on, if anything is excellent, if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure and lovely, all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things. The God of peace will be with you. 
As we look at the world, let's ask God to show us, show it to us through the lens of heaven on earth, through the lens of what is lovely and worthy and just. Through his words and his life, Paul reminds us that God is present in everything, that nothing is outside the reach of God's transformative power, that anywhere we are can be a place where God's love is shared by us and with us. God's peace can follow us around no matter our circumstances. God's love certainly does. If we are called to live as if God is fully present in all circumstances, then Paul's call to rejoice is an encouragement, but also an acknowledgement that the world is what we make it. Now, I don't know where you are today on the roller coaster of emotions that is Pandemic Living 2020, but I do know that there are reasons to rejoice, no matter where you are at. Rejoice because God's big plan is a feast and no one is left out. Rejoice because we are all invited and it's entirely not dependent on our good behavior, our ability to homeschool our kids, our ability to work from home, or our positive attitude, or lack thereof. Rejoice because we are not passive receivers, but partners with God's big plan. Rejoice because death doesn't win, Tears will be wiped away. The burial shroud will be lifted. And rejoice because God holds the future. And the future is the best party ever. Amen.